Good morning, Mets fans, and welcome to a Thursday edition of Driving with Mr. Met. As my children get on their school bus to go to school, the Mets need to get on a school bus and figure out and learn how to win again because last night they lost again, five straight. Um, last night, really disappointing loss, uh, really not even a gut punching loss because it would, they were out of the game after the first inning, seemingly. but. Uh, I want to talk about what happened last night and talk about going forward and whether or not this means the end for this team. Uh, hint, I don't think it does mean the end for this team, but then again, as I've gone over multiple times, I am crazy when it comes to fandom for the Mets and thinking the best when even the worst is happening. So, talk about that on today's show, and I'll do that right now. The, uh, the, the old adage that the first game of the series sets the tone for the series um, usually rings true. And, you know, the first game, Marcus Stroman, as we've discussed, wasn't great, but wasn't bad. I mean, he gave up four runs. That's, that's not awful, you know. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the reality is um, it, it sort of set the, the, the stage for what happened last night. And last night... Noah Syndergaard, despite um, coming off of eight consecutive really, really good starts. I mean, Noah's been right up there with Jake as far as his dominance in the second half. Um, and and he's the guy that we wanted on the mound. You know, even though we lost the opening game for the of the series to the Cubs, in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, this is, this is okay. We got Noah and, and we got Jake going the next two nights. We're going to take two out of three. And that's not what happened. <laughs> uh, certainly not last night. Um, Noah Syndergaard was uh, at his absolute worst. It was uh, statistically the worst start of his career. Uh, as we know, he lasted three whole innings and he gave up four runs. I'm sorry, I wish four runs. Yeah, my, uh, he gave up ten runs. Nine of them earned. Now, the uh, I will say the defense behind him was very sloppy. Uh, Rosario's first first inning blunder with the shovel pass to uh, right center field instead of the second base um, to try to turn two. That was a terrible play, and that, that was a, a, a real momentum shifter right out of the gates for uh, for the Mets. But, you know, you'd go to the batter before that. syndergaard has got two strikes on, on Nicholas Castellanos, and he hits him in the wrist. You know, he, he puts the guy on base. And that was the story of the night. You know, Syndergaard was ahead in, in most of the counts. Uh, he, he, he looked like he had his good stuff, but he was leaving stuff over the plate with two strikes, not executing his pitches, and the Cubs were, in, to their credit, ready to hit. And they certainly did, to the, to the tune of, as I said, 10 runs across the three innings. Um, it wasn't just the, the Rosario blunder in the first inning. Uh, in the second inning, J.D. Davis and Rosario had a little bit of a miscue in shallow left field on a pop fly that neither of them um, uh, caught, and, and neither of them even attempted to catch. They just sort of both stood around where it was going to land and, and watched it land, almost like they were spotters, um, you know, <laughs> instead of catchers. Uh, but, you know, it, it, and of course, um, Noah couldn't limit that damage. He ends up giving up a two-run homer after getting up six in the first. It's 8 nothing in the second. Uh, sorry, 8-1 in the second. And then 10-1 uh, to, to one after three. And that was it for Syndergaard for the day. Now, on the bright side, um, the, the Mets bullpen was excellent last night. It kept the Cubs off the board for, after the third inning. The Cubs did not score again. So that's a positive. Um, the Mets offense did claw back and get to within three runs. 10-7 to seven was the final. But the problem with the Mets offense, as it has been over these, these last couple of days, has been the lack of timely hitting. Um, just guys getting on base, guys getting into scoring position, and the, the guys at the plate not executing. Uh, last night, J.D. Davis hits into a double play. I think it was on the first pitch after the Mets had runners on uh, first and second, um, Davis hits into that double play. And I think it was on the first pitch of the at-bat. And J.D. seemed a little bit anxious last night. He did get two hits. I mean, what, I can't complain completely about him. Not like he pulled a Pete and went over. Uh, not like he pulled a Juan Lagares, who yesterday I was pining to be in the lineup for. And he, what does he do last night? He goes 0 for 5 and strikes out to end the game and fails to produce... Uh, at all, and in a in a huge five-run inning, makes two of the three outs 
<laughs> for the Mets. So, and and the guy who I said should be benched, Todd Frazier, comes in off the bench and gets two hits, uh, starts two rallies. So, what, I guess I'm wrong. You know, maybe I should just defer to what Mickey Calloway is doing um, and, and just shut my mouth because uh, I, I was clearly uh, clearly wrong, at least as the results showed today. Um, I, I wasn't wrong though. I think everyone would agree that, that Frazier's time in the starting lineup was, is is up. Uh, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, um, the Simply Amazing podcast, which I just found like two days ago. I was browsing the iPod, uh, uh, iPod, iPod, the podcasts app on my iPhone, and I saw Simply Amazing, so I downloaded it and listened to it. And they talked about, and I, I forgive myself or forgive me for not uh, remembering the names of the, the hosts of the show, but they talked about. Um, Todd Frazier getting a lesser role and being able to accept it. And they equated it to Michael Kadair in 2015. And I thought that was a good analogy to compare those two things to each other because Frazier in 2019 has the diminishing skill set that Kadair had in 2015. Um, so much so in the Kadair case that he retired after the season. But he and but the point and the comparison was that Kadair accepted his quote-unquote demotion to a role on the bench, remained that veteran presence in the locker room on a different team, admittedly, uh, a team that was mostly full of younger players. Um, having Kadire there was sort of like having that wise uncle uh, available for, for counseling as needed, but uh, he wasn't raising the kids, you know, if that makes sense. Um, Frazier's role there is less important as far as that veteran presence clubhouse leader sort of guy but he can provide value off the bench hitting against left-handers um spelling for defense late so demoting Frazier to the bench to a bench role and I guess maybe pulling him out of the starting lineup is not the end of the role end of the world nor would it be the end of his career um and I, I hope that if if things stay as they are and they were last night and frankly the lineup last night was about as it should be constructed um, I, I might not have Davis batting second, but whatever, I, I would I like to see Rosario leading off and McNeil batting second. Um, but that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, they both, both McNeil and Davis put up numbers last night in their respective roles, so I can't complain too much about the positioning uh, in the lineup. So um, where are we at? You know, where do we go now from here? The Mets, like I said, they battled back. That, that the fact that they made this a three-run game, after uh, basically getting destroyed for, for the first three innings. Um, that still should show us that there is still life left in this team. There's still fight left in this team. Does this five-game losing streak hinder their abilities to make the playoffs? Absolutely. Uh, it, it throws a huge monkey wrench into the plan. You know, this does not feel like the team that just a week ago swept the Cleveland Indians, right? It seems like a team that uh, this past weekend was swept by the Florida Marlins or something. Um, but it is the team that swept the Indians, and that's the thing. And that's the thing that's so frustrating about this is that it's the same guys that are hot and cold. You know, oh, I got to block the sun. Look at that. Block the sun. Same guys that are hot and cold, um, like, from one day to the next. It's insane. Uh, you know, like I said with Ligaris last night, 0 for 5. In, in the worst possible spots, these guys seem to just not be able to perform. And I don't know if it's the big moment that they're not ready to perform in or, or what it is. But the, these guys need to be more consistent. Uh, Alonso took a tough over last night. And look, we can't expect him to hit a home run every night. Um, would it have been nice for Alonso to have been able to come up as a tying run or as the, the bat whose who's one swing could get this game to within one or two runs? Yes, that would have been really nice. Would he have delivered in the moment? I, I can't say that, but... You know, Pete's got that flair for the dramatics. So he let off a couple of innings, and that's not the best spot for him to be in. Uh, but again, it's a loss. Um, whether it would have been 10 to 1 or 10 to 7, it still counts as the same value on the, the scorecard and in the standings. So the Mets lose their fifth consecutive game. They, game, they drop to four back in the, in the wild card hunt. And now they find themselves in the position that the San Francisco Giants were in not a few, uh, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, uh, where they're now officially a fringe playoff team, where a couple more bad losses like this, and that's it. I mean, you can stick the fork in the Mets. Um, 30 games left to play from here on out. And they're going to need to go 20 and 10 
at least, <laughs> to, to make the playoffs. So, And it isn't like the road gets any easier after this series is over tonight. Uh, because tomorrow the Mets go on the road, whereas we all know they have not played well. They start a road trip, a six-game trip, within the division. Three in Philly tonight, uh, sorry, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then uh, three in D.C. for the annual uh, Labor Day series with the Nationals. So uh, I, I hate to sort of pin the season on six games. Um, but including what happens tonight, so we'll say seven. If the Mets don't write things in the next seven games, and I'm talking like you're going to need to go five and two in those seven, uh, that's it. I got as, I got as optimistic as I usually am. I've got to be realistic sometimes, and I think that's going to do it. If they don't go five and two, um, four and three is acceptable, but that means that you're going to have to drop uh, two out of three to the Nationals and not to the Phillies because you can't afford to fall further behind Philadelphia in the wild card standings. So, so um, I'm not as depressed as I thought I would be this morning. Um, I'm bummed that Syndergaard couldn't deliver last night, but Look, it's one start for him. He's otherwise been terrific in the second half. So I'm not going to say I'm giving him a pass, but uh, clearly the loss is really on him last night. And uh, he knows it, and hopefully he comes out next time and is better. Tonight, the Mets rely on Jacob deGrom. And honestly, if you need someone to be a stopper, there's nobody better on the planet than the best pitcher on the planet to be the stopper. So deGrom needs to put up zeros tonight, and I'm talking zeros. He needs to pitch a shutout. And he needs to pitch a complete game shutout. That's it. Too much to ask from our ace? Maybe. <laughs> but we'll see. So that'll wrap it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow to talk about the complete game shutout that Jacob DeGrom is about to throw uh, this evening. Uh, and the Mets' first victory in uh, in five, uh, six days. And uh, we'll go from there. Because after tonight, things get really tough going on the road, as I said. And I'll talk about all that tomorrow. So until then, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, you can follow me on the Twitter at Mr. Underscore Met. That's M-I-S-T-E-R underscore M-E-T. And as always, let's go Mets.